Uh, thank you, Darian, so much for joining us today. Um, thank you for having that, me. Thank you. We, we've done something wrong with our marketing and we don't have, oh, something just went wrong. Oh, that's, that's weird. Now, uh, Angela, can you made Joe the co-host instead of me? Oh, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> too many Joes in the room is what's going on. <laughs> Far too many Joes in the room. Yeah. So, um, we have done something wrong with our marketing and and we haven't had people showing up. Plus we've had, uh, my website has been down for the week. We just found that out. So we're having technology issues. I don't quite know why, but anyway, Darian, thank you so much. We'll make it through. We'll make it through. <laughs> we'll make it. Uh, thank you for coming and joining us. And, um, uh, the first question that I always like to ask is when did you first know that you were a filmmaker? Uh, that's such a such a good question. Um, I, I think it started with storytelling, and it, it started when I was, let's say, in maybe middle school. And the problem I was having with writing stories is that my brain was so full of ideas mm. that my teacher would say, "Okay, take a look at this short story that you turned in, and then count how many periods you have." Mm. And so it would be like a whole page of writing of this like fantastic story, things happening everywhere. And there was only one period at the very end of the page. <laughs> and she said, we've got to work on that. Well, she said, well, I was an English teacher for a long time. So, yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely credit an, an English teacher, uh, a few of them, for kind of recognizing that I had a lot to say and helping me sort of corral that into, I, I had one teacher in the ninth grade, I still remember his name is Mr. Baker. <laughs> and yeah, I remember Mr. Baker from the ninth grade because I was still struggling with this whole crunching ideas into it, as many ideas as I could as if it was the end of the world, you know, one sentence had to have everything. And he said, listen, uh, you got a D on this paper uh, because, you know, frankly, structure wise, it's very poorly <laughs> put together. <laughs> he says, listen to me. I know that you really want to say what you want to say. I'm going to give you an A plus on this paper <laughs> if you can rewrite it for me and you ensure that I have only one idea per sentence. If you, it doesn't matter, he said, it doesn't matter if it makes sense. It doesn't matter if it fits the structure. I just want one idea per sentence. And if you accomplish that, you get an A plus on this paper. And that was literally, yeah, it was the turning point. I, I did it, I, I forced it to one idea per sentence. And I don't know if the whole flow of it even made sense, but I got that A plus. And from then on, it really sunk in that I like, I have to be able to communicate in, in bites that people can understand. Yeah. It's amazing that you just told that story because uh, yeah, I was an English teacher for a long time. And one of the things that I find with filmmakers is many of them are, have exactly that brain that you just described, where it's just like, you know, well, and, yeah. and, and the way I think of it is that uh filmmakers are totally in what i think of as the sea of creativity which is the feminine and one of the things that whoa what oh my dad's calling me from trinidad sorry not the right time <laughs> hi dad um, <laughs> hi dad <laughs> um and that what one of the things that i do is bring the masculine to their creativity because without logic and structure they they're it's sort of you end up with nothing that's right right yeah. so you were given that very early on have yes some structure, have some logic one thing at a time <laughs> slow it down because your brain is going way slow too it fast. down slow it down you know and <laughs> and my brain still goes at that rate yeah. uh, that never changed but i did learn to slow things down, communicate in, in simpler chunks so that I can reach people. And um, that, that helped a lot. 
And English turned out to be one of my favorite subjects in, in, in high school. So, <laughs> yeah, well, you, you were lucky because, um, you know, I came here in 1984 and I was teaching English at the University of Miami. And what oh, I yeah. learned was that most Americans have been absolutely traumatized by their English teachers oh, you know, yeah. by yeah. the time they get to uh, university. So <laughs> I was like, so, yeah. and I still find that's the case a lot. Mm filmmakers, they have so much um, fear about getting it wrong. And that was often put in them by their English teachers. Um, yeah. So um, sometimes we just have to sort of remove all of that fear and, you know, get past thinking that we're going to get slapped like, on the wrist or something. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I often find myself saying to my clients, um, I am not your high school English teacher, although I can play one on TV. <laughs> you were, I hope you weren't doing the slapping on the wrist, right? Were you nope. one of those? Never, okay, never, good. never, never. I was never one of those. I was never one of those. Good, good. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. No, no, no. I was, I was more like, oh my God, what did they do to you over here? You know? Okay. So I mean, you, weren't, you weren't one of those that Pink Floyd was talking about in the wall, nope. right? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. And, and, you know, when I came here, I couldn't understand because, you know, they would be talking about all these things like sentence structure and all these grammar things. Yeah. We never were taught that in England. Interesting. We were Very just interesting. Right. We were just taught to write. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I've had to learn all of that since I came to America, all of that left brain, um, English composition stuff. I, ha I learned all of that as an adult in America. Yeah. Never never heard any of it before yeah you can't <laughs> have any you can't have any pudding if you haven't eaten your meat right <laughs> how can you have any pudding if you've not eaten your meat <laughs> so, so when did you make your first short film oh man um so my first short film as as a director you know where i claimed the name you know the title director would have been five years ago mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm only five years into this um, I've been writing for much longer than that. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, the funny thing is, I, I made a lot of mistakes. So <laughs> if there's anybody who wants to learn, you know, how to, how, to, how to avoid a lot of those mistakes, I'm probably the right person to talk to. One of the things I did was I started by wanting to make a feature as the very first project. Uh -huh. And I actually did that. So, oh. um, and, and not only that, but it was a feat. It's science fiction because, you know, science fiction is, is my bag. And uh, I wanted to shoot it in one room. That was the idea. It was called Escape Room. And uh, but I initially wanted to shoot it in a practical room and have it built. But as we were in process and everything like that, it turned out that we weren't going to have the space for as long as we needed. And so I got this great idea to shoot the whole thing on green screen in the living room of my apartment. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> so I said about like changing the dining room into a green screen room. I built a cyclic wall literally in a I I didn't own this place. So literally I'm building this green cyclic wall, painting the walls, doing all this, this stuff. And we shot the whole film on green screen. And I still want that film to come out. But the issue with that film is that I didn't think about the post-production side. And I just didn't have the resources or even the skill at the time to handle all of that post-production. It wouldn't have run through my computer. I didn't have a budget to do it. And so that film, while I love the performances and I love what we did and everything like that, it was just too ambitious for me to take on as an indie at that stage. And, you know, in general, I would say to people out there, don't start with a feature. <laughs> <laughs> don't there are steps that you can take <laughs> you know but I, i'm in general i'm a pretty ambitious person so that that's very typical of me is to always overshoot and then course correct and and kind of uh, adjust yeah and, and you know i have a joke about science fiction that i say you know i say if you are not british don't attempt science fiction <laughs> what i mean i, I want to hear this Yes, what I mean by that is that the Brits are absolutely brilliant at doing things for no money, mm -hmm. uh, even and including science fiction. So mm -hmm. one example I give is The Lobster. 
So the lobster yeah. is a sort of breakout indie success. For sure. And about um, a kind of uh, camp, I guess, in the in the future where you are sent if your relationship breaks up and you're given three months to get into a new relationship. Yeah. If you fail to get into a new relationship, you are turned into your favorite animal. <laughs> right. And the hero of our story has picked a lobster. Right. <laughs> All I can say is that the genius of low budget in this film is that we actually don't ever see a lobster. Right, right. And it's called so, the lobster. That's and it's right. called the lobster. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. So yeah. what is it that you like so much about science fiction? Ooh, oh my goodness. We only have an hour, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but to, to put it in a nutshell, for me, it's the, it's the idea that so i believe in manifestation so that's one thing right so i believe that if i truly believe anything enough in my mind that the world i can make the world kind of conform to that and materialize the thing that i want i, I fully fully believe that and i also believe that science fiction can give us images of the future and open our minds to different ways of thinking. Mm, I like it, yeah. E even about situations that we're dealing with now, mm -hmm. you know? So if we think about, for example, one of my favorite movies, Ex Machina, mm -hmm. by a British writer-director, Alex Garland, probably one of the best in the business right now. Um, it's about AI and it's about a robot and this young man's relationship to figuring out if this AI is, is real or not. But I think the reason it has resonance, at least with me and maybe with others, is that even though you're dealing with an AI and that's an abstract idea, I think it kind of makes you ask the question, what is love? So this young man is sort of falling in love with an AI, even though he knows it's an AI. Right, right. But the question that I could ask myself is, if I'm in a relationship with someone, how do I know if what I'm feeling for that person or what they're, I'm perceiving as love being returned to me, how do I actually know if they love me? I can't get inside this person's head and know what they're really thinking. And people are great performers in general. And, and I think that's just something that's interesting. And then the last part of it is, does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> does it matter, right? You know, if you have a wife and, and she, acts like she loves you and she treats you in a way that you'd like to be treated if she's performing or not and doing a great job performing you have to ask the question does it matter <laughs> that's great that's great yeah. yeah yeah so i like science fiction because it allows us to to do that in a way that's not direct right because if i were to make a movie and say hey is your wife faking her love for you is she faking her orgasms you know now who you're bristling, right? You're like, no, 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 she would never do that. I'm a great guy and I like pay the bills and I've, I've got <laughs> swagger and charisma, you know? But, but if I do it in a sci-fi way, I can, get you in, I can get you into my world without those bristles and those defenses coming up. Yes, yes. So what you're saying is, is sci-fi is a way to explore questions, I guess, questions about life today, but sort of in a, in a context that will maybe, we can be more open-minded maybe. Absolutely, yeah. To look, at those, to look at those questions from a yeah. different perspective. Yeah, that's great, yeah. great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So when, once you sort of realize that escape room, you were stuck, what, what did you do? What did you so do? That's when I decided, okay, I need to make a short. <laughs> So I, made a, I did a 48 hour film festival here in Atlanta, which is a great way to meet people and make projects. Yes. Um, the short did, did, did quite well, um, you know, at that 48 and had me meet a lot of people, new collaborators. Mm -hmm. And then I made a short called Hop. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that short called Hop is, is basically about um, a, a special drug, a boutique drug that gets on the market and these two characters, they use that drug. And you basically, you drop this, these droplets into your eyes. And then when it gets into your system, it allows you to hop into somebody else's perspective and anybody that you look at. So I could look at you, for example, and I could go, 
and I would jump right into your brain essentially and see from your eyes. You can see what they see, hear what they hear. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, I love that film. I it was it was my first you know real like short that was planned, shot listed, had a nice sized crew. Uh, I had a makeup artist who who doubled as my producer on that, Natalie Varengia, who was amazing at helping get it all organized. Um, I worked with um, a DP, Chris Magdalensky, who was able to get that vision that I wanted a very bright um, pink and blue. You know, that's the thing I saw right away was like this really distinct look. And to this day, when people see that thumbnail or see you know any images from that movie, it really it really jumps out at them because it doesn't really look like a lot of other things. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and, and that film went to the finals of the Atlanta Sci-Fi Film Festival. Um, it, it got me a lot of attention and, and made me, gave me the confidence to be like, guess what? I think I can do this. <laughs> yeah, Hop did that for me, for sure. So it kind of, it kind of reversed the, uh, the process with Escape Room where you, you got stuck and hit a wall and, and yeah. move forwards, yes. Uh, yeah, I got, I got all of the Escape Room shot. We got the whole yes, thing yes. shot. And it just sat there on my hard drives because I was like, I, I have no way to show this to people. Yeah. And you know, part of making films is showing it to people. That's, that's pretty right. important. <laughs> pretty important. I think that's pretty important. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's five years later and Escape Room is still on my hard drives. I mean, I'll go back and get it done, but it's just, you know, it, it, I, just out of sheer, just will I want that movie to just be finished, you know? Uh, but at the same time, you know, you develop so many more skills, you meet so many more people. so. It's, it's kind of hard to be like, okay, let me go back. You know, I would really have to set aside, you know, a solid year probably, you know, and just focus on that uh, if I wanted to do that. Yeah. Would you do it yourself? Would you edit it? Uh, no, I don't think I would anymore. No, it's too big. Yeah. I, I mean, I do a lot of visual. I'm much better at visual effects now. And so I, I could do a lot of it. Yeah. But yeah. it's just too much. You know, that, that was the thing that I overestimated my own. It's just... I, I'm just really over ambitious is, is usually my first thing is always going to be too big of a step. And then I always have to kind of pull it back. Similar to the story with the writing, I, I think I, that's a kind of recurring thing for me, you know, and it's, yes. it's just hard for me to, to I'll always, yeah, I have to always overstep. And then I realize, oh, there's the boundary. Okay. <laughs> that's great. I, I actually want to take a little, uh, a little detour here, I think. Sure. Um, so Darian and I met on Clubhouse. Yeah. And I have been on Clubhouse now for about three months, I guess. And by the time you've been on for three months, you're an old timer. <laughs> and, um, I wondered if you could say a little bit about what you're finding beneficial about spending time on Clubhouse. Yeah, yeah. So, so I had an issue with Clubhouse at first uh, because I, I'm, I'm older school in the way of meeting people, right? I've never really had people that I've met online. Mm, that right. I have these these rich, deep, meaningful relationships. So everything in my life, literally everyone that I've had a really deep, meaningful relationship to this date, I've met in person. And so I had to really come to terms. Clubhouse sort of brought me because of COVID and then with the advent of Clubhouse. Clubhouse made me evaluate my own prejudice against that form of meeting people mm. where, because I was making relationships so fast that I was distrusting the quality of those relationships because I was saying, well, this is weird to meet somebody online and have this kind of like affection for them, caring. <laughs> like I, I have, I feel like it's a community. I really yeah. feel like I am getting to know these people on Clubhouse because we spend so much time on there, you know? And so, um, so I, 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 I literally had this whole meditation with myself where I said, listen, you know, um, let this thing happen. It feels right. So let it happen. And, and I, and so for me, so that's a way of saying to, so once I kind of let that happen and not try to second guess, like the amount of time that I spend on there, 
because I was like, wow, I'm spending so much time. I'm doing this. Is the, this the right thing? But then I asked myself, I said, but does it feel right? <laughs> you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So like, let's disengage the head for a moment. Uh, that's telling me all of these other mechanical things about like, oh, well, you know, it's, this is, is this productive in this way? And what are the benefits? And, blah, 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 blah. and let, let's just go with, does this feel right? You know, and the reality of it, it feels right. And it could be maybe a healing thing because of COVID. I don't really know. Uh, but at this moment, it feels like where I should be. And I started a thing called the uh, One Minute Film Room, Darren Danji One Minute Film, Film School. Um, we started it in January. We just had the March competition. Six of my students uh, competed and created one minute films, which are now on YouTube. And, you know, we had awards. Uh, we had judges from Clubhouse award those. And, and I just, that for me, that moment of wow. seeing actual films produced from something that came in my head in January, I said to myself, Clubhouse would be perfect to share some of what I know, even though I'm not an expert, right? I'm no, I'm no Joanne Butcher. I'm no Ridley Scott yet. Um, but I love that you put me in the same sentence as Ridley Scott. Thank you. <laughs> well, sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sir Ridley is the man, you know. And Tony Scott, his brother, is is probably one of my one of the, the my favorite directors uh, that I look up to. Uh, may he rest in peace. But like, you know, even though I'm not there yet emphasis on yet, <laughs> I, I still have a lot that I can share. And there's a value in that because there are people who want to do the same things that I've been doing. And so I can help those people. And then as I continue to grow, I can continue to help people. And Clubhouse has allowed me to share a lot and, and, and seeing those films completed of the students uh, was a moment where I said, you know what, this is stop second guessing it and just go with just go with what it is just let it happen you know the universe is presenting something that's amazing run with it and um how much time do you spend on clubhouse in a week i'm probably on clubhouse i would say at least five to six hours a day at least a day yeah, at least, at oh least. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, my gosh. And, and so even if I'm not like, but but then again, I've gotten pretty smart about the multitasking, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I'll be on there and I might be editing something or I might be doing some admin or I might be doing, you know, a, a lot of different things that I do. And that took a while to figure out that balance because it was at first I wasn't doing that. Like the first few weeks was just, I'm just on there and I'm just like this, you know, but now it's like, you know, yeah, and 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 I and I'm going to continue to invest in Clubhouse because I believe in it. It suits me very well because I don't always have to get you know yep. pr pretty like we have to do on a Zoom or like a live, you know. So um, yeah, so so I, I I do invest that time. I have a club called Movie Makers, and Movie Makers is growing pretty fast. And um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to invest in it because I do believe I believe in it. I believe in I believe that it's good way to help people focus they can get the questions answered that saves them time like if i had been on clubhouse for example before i started making my feature film somebody would have smacked me down and said well how are you going to edit it right like you know that would have that would have that would have immediately yeah i would have saved a lot of time you yes. know and i think that's the value i mean a lot of people talk about connections and this that and the other I'm not so concerned with that. I mean, those things will happen naturally, but people maybe could underestimate just the value of just information, you know? I mean, yeah. you know, think about, think about like the value of a mentor. It, it, you know, people's lives and careers have been made by just having one good mentor. And think about Clubhouse. You have like a whole sea of, there's a sea of it. So what is the possibility when you have all the best mentors potentially in the world at your fingertips? willing to share so yeah yeah i'm a fan yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes definitely and that was one of the things i wanted to ask you about because we did meet on clubhouse and i spend tops three hours a week on clubhouse okay okay i'm in three people's rooms and yeah I, I still don't have my own room. I just go, I just show up. They've been, they've invited me. I show up Perfect. and, and yeah. I love it. 
And yes. so, so there's there's any range, I think, from my three hours to your five, th three hours a week to your five hours a day. Um, yeah. And anything in between. But I think that, you know, I know that for a lot of my clients, we're finding it to be a very exciting place to be. And yeah. given that we can't um, go to film festivals or film markets in person right now, it's just great to have uh, yeah. such a such a vibrant and um, incredible networking space. There's one other thing. You don't have to say a word. You just, just absorb. Yeah. All you can things. just sit there and absorb. But there's one other benefit that I've noticed from Clubhouse, which can both often get overlooked. So you know that feeling when you go to a film festival and you leave that festival and you're just roaring to do your pro your next project, whatever project you had, you were already, it's not like you're changing paths or anything, but you were maybe already working on stuff. But when you leave that film festival, you're almost bursting to get on the computer and re rewrite, revise, shot list, do whatever, you know? Yes. And yes. I've noticed that that effect is an effect that I have on a daily basis on Clubhouse. Right. Because I'm like talking to, like if I'm talking to Tim Story, who's got a movie out in theaters right now, Tom and Jerry, you know? And then I get off, I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got to, you know, I've got, I, you know? It, it just it just makes everything more tangible and that manifestation thing it, it's like it tickles the manifestation engine because if you literally just like we had a watch party with uh, clara aronovich who's on the app very often and she just had a movie with blumhouse that came out called tentacles mm -hmm. and so i arranged a together with uh, onif we arranged a watch party of her movie now imagine the effect that has on me onif everybody in the room to watch the movie with the creator and she invited the two lead actors. Love so you're it. literally watching with the people who created the whole movie and she's giving us the whole skinny. How did it work with the deal? What shots did she have to compromise on? What things she wishes she could do better? Why did she choose mm. that music? Why did, you know, all of those things. Man, like as soon as I get off there, I'm like, I can do this too, you know? And, and that for me, I think is really the, the biggest benefit is that energy. That is so well said, Darren. So well said because um, the uh, the way the that it seems to work on the app is it feels as though we're so close to the people who are in the industry and doing it and making the movies and all of that happen. Yeah. And it just feel it feels as though there's very little barrier to entry, and 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 that is extremely encouraging and motivating as well. Yeah. So, so thank you for the clubhouse chat. So now I wanted to ask you about the short film that you have 2 million views, um, because that is a story that I really want to hear about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, so mommy is, is kind of my flagship sh short in the sense that it's done the best. It's on my channel, uh, movie fandom, which is YouTube forward slash C forward slash movie fandom, all one word, movie fandom. Or, you know, mommy horror short film, if you type that in uh, to Google, I mean, to YouTube, it'll it'll pull up. But so that short's actually, it's at 1.7 million views is what, what that one is. Wow. And then all my other shorts are also on that channel. And then the total of all of the shorts is over 2 million, uh, is over 2 million views. So, um, and I know exactly how it happened. So uh, I, I definitely, anybody who's on who wants to sort of, I mean, I, I can't say one, two, three, exactly how to recreate, but I can mm -hmm. tell you what worked for me. And that was that I'm in the science fiction space. I knew I wanted to build this channel, Movie Fandom. And I knew I wanted to have sci-fi, horror, and, and, and thrillers on there exclusively. Yeah, that's the one. That's it. <laughs> I hear that little boy's, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's little Mason. <laughs> um, and so I knew, I knew I wanted to build that channel, uh, you know, for that purpose. So what I did was I started with fan films. So on that channel mm -hmm. is a, is a web series, a very low budget. I shot it in my sister's basement, low budget web series about the Joker and Harley Quinn. Ha, huh, right. Yeah. And I dropped that web series shortly after the release of Suicide Squad. Uh -huh. And the, the web series was motivated because um, 
the Suicide Squad left a really big gap because everybody thought that they would get more backstory between the Joker and Harley Quinn, which is a very interesting backstory mm. of how she was a, psychi- a young psychiatrist at this insane asylum. He was one of the worst patients, so she got kind of the worst gig because none of the other psychs really wanted to deal with him. And so because of her inexperience and his criminal mastermindery and craziness, he was able to turn her over time and mm-hmm. basically make her, you know, you know, his his scion or whatever and uh, and manipulate her. And that's how he then escaped and all of that. But that story, that turn is so interesting and, and it wasn't addressed in the movie. And, and people were very upset. The, oh. the hardcore fans were very upset that they thought they were going to see that. Huh. But they only got like a 30 second kind of really quick like montage or something. So I was like, ding, ding, ding. That might be a moment for me to jump in and satisfy that itch, scratch that itch. So I made a seven episode web series. Each episode's only three minutes long. And so in total, the whole runtime is maybe like, you know, 17 minutes or 18 minutes or so. Or, you know, yeah, what, what, seven times, 21 minutes, 21 minutes. My math is uh... a... <laughs> so it's about 21 minutes, but it's broken into these seven episodes and people loved it. You know, it got a lot of hits on YouTube because, you know, Joker, Harley Quinn, people are searching for that and then they find it. And then all of these fangirls love my lead actor. Like they were like, they wanted to physically get their hands on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, I did not know, I didn't know that was gonna happen. You know, they were like, who is this guy? And then I found out that he was getting like all kinds of DMs all of a sudden, like an explosion of DMs. Wow. And then, yeah, like, you know, it was, it was, it was wild. So, um, and then uh, the actress who played Harleen Quinn is the actress who plays in my short Mommy. She's the mommy, she's the one who's crawling along the, along the floor as the mommy. And she's, she's a Swedish, Swedish American um, actress, singer, uh, yeah, very, very talented young lady. And I, I would always work with her. She's, she's just very mm. committed. Mm. Um, but yeah, so essentially those fan films is what got my, my page, mm-hmm. my channel monetized and got me into the YouTube sphere where it's like now, then when I drop things, it gives it a little bit more credibility and I did a test with mommy. I dropped it on two channels on the same day, on the same time. I dropped it on my personal, my Darian Donju YouTube channel. And I dropped it on my movie fandom YouTube channel at the mm-hmm. same time on the same day, because I wanted to see what the difference would be putting on a monetized channel versus a non-monetized channel. And the difference was- which Monetized channel, which one? Yeah, is- Darian Donju, my, uh, the one that's just my name. Uh-huh is just like, I put little experiments up there. It's not as, you know, kind of, the work is not as polished. It's more just what I feel like putting up there. Uh huh. And so, so that channel, um, I dropped it on there and I dropped it on Movie Phantom at the same time. And the one on my channel maybe has like 21,000 views or something. Uh-huh, and the uh-huh. one on the monetized channel has 1.7 million views. Mm. So as you can see, yeah, that the YouTube algorithm does like monetization. <laughs> the, uh, what was the URL for the movie fandom one? Oh yeah, I've only so seen the other one. I've seen your one, but I haven't seen that one. Oh, got you. Yeah. So uh, movie fandom is you could probably put mommy horror short film. Yeah. Uh, in in YouTube. And then, and then that'll maybe get you right there faster. Okay, so I found the short film, Ooh. and but that one says Darian Danju. Yeah, that's my, yeah. So I dropped it on two channels at the same time. I see. Yeah. I see. And so, so that was my little social experiment. Yes. And, mm-hmm, and I learned that yeah, monetization does matter. So go back a little bit then uh, to where before you had a channel that was monetized. Um, This is something that I think that a lot of people would love to know about. I I, I actually worked for YouTube for a while. Oh my goodness, yeah. Hired by them to, they were in the movie rental business. Mm -hmm. Actually, you can still rent movies on on YouTube. Yeah, absolutely. You can rent everything on YouTube. I I often 
find people don't realize that that's the case. Yeah. But you rent every movie on, on YouTube. Just they, like Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't, um, they don't push it anymore. But at the yeah. time, uh, they were um, pushing that. And I was hired. This is so weird. They um, had a UK movie rental channel and an American was running it. And at first they hired me to just translate into British. Yeah, <laughs> so, into British, right. <laughs> knowing the holidays, knowing what British people were interested in, that kind of thing. And then yeah. I was hired to take over the channel. And okay. it was a massive learning curve. And just about when I had, when I one day I literally was driving along and I was like, you know what? I think I've got it. It was the day that they pulled the curators. Um, but it was so, so much fun. I was working with people from all around the world, curating different countries. Um, but I remember that morning, I had also seen a big banner on YouTube for the first time in, when I was uh, in the UK uh, YouTube that said Netflix. And I thought, hmm, that's odd. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And they pulled all their um, advertising and curating and everything. Wow. Um, so, uh, yeah, could you explain a little bit how you went from not having a YouTube monetized channel to having a monetized channel? Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. So, so because I had some experience with YouTube before, um, obviously with my own channel, which my own channel is more of a personal, you know, I mean, it's like, I, I, I'm not pushing that one as hard, right? It's got right. maybe a thousand subscribers, but, you know, I would do these film impressions or these little tests and these little, just these little things that aren't necessarily meant to be like complete short films or uh -huh. anything like that. Uh -huh. And um, so I was learning from that, you know, that, that really helped me. Um, and so I knew when I when I wanted to make the movie fandom channel and have it be more targeted towards, you know, you know, sci fi fans, you know, sci fi fans. And then maybe with some horror, or some thriller. Um, I knew that you had to get, you know, at least 100,000 views mm -hmm. is what you have to have. And mm -hmm. you need to have a certain number of watch. Out. I mean, they change the rules all the time. So you okay. check whatever the latest is. But at the time, I believe it was like at least 100,000 views. And okay. then like four uh, four thousand watch hours within the last twelve months okay. on the channel as a whole. So you know, so the YouTube algorithm, um, you know, is very trend oriented, and it's very based on what people type and search. And it's if you have things that are related to things that are searching, you're going to get more views. Mm. And and so I knew that if I drop, you know, some original film. You know, some random guy named Darren Danju drops an original film. It doesn't really matter how interesting that film is in and of itself. It's probably not going to get much attention if it's not a trending topic or it's not related to anything. Mm -hmm. So that's why I knew starting with the fan films was going to be the way to to build that uh, to build that channel. Um, I, I think I saw you. You found the link, right? You yes, I did. I did to, to movie fandom. Yeah. So so if you go back and look, and and so it's like instead of let's say filming that fan film and making it one 21 minute long film, yes. which, which I actually did. So I actually shot it and I edited it as a 21 minute film. And, and then I went back and broke it up into three minute increments and made an intro and an outro and um, put it out as segments. Why? Because I, want, I needed the views, right? I want to get a hundred thousand yeah. views. Yeah. And, and so and you don't need to do it with one film. You can do it with all seven is the, across all the seven. Yeah. And you'll get more views because I yeah. think each of those films, maybe, you know, 20,000, 19,000, 17,000. But let's say I only had one film. I might have only had 20,000 views total. Yes. For, you, you know, because it's but the same people are going to continue. And then now those views are multiplied. Right. right. So more importantly, it has more reach. Because since it's seven films, all with this Joker, Harley, it's got little, I write the text in there. There are lots of comments. That's another thing that um, comments are a really big deal. Mm. So that's what, you know, when I do the Daring Donju one minute film school, even I say, you don't need to pay me any money for my mentorship, but 
please pay me in social media currency. Mm. So go to my movie fandom channel, watch my shorts, leave comments, because mm. comments tell the YouTube algorithm that that film is engaging, right? That's, that's the only way it can tell. So it doesn't matter if the comments are negative or if they're positive, uh -huh. as long as you can get a reaction and have people type some comments in, you know, uh, YouTube says, oh, people are engaged with this content. So, um, so, the, so the fact that they, you know, that they were into the hot actor or whatever, you know, all these teenage girls and everything like that, that helped a lot, right? Because they're all like, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. And heart, 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 <laughs> kiss, 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 and then emoji, emoji, emoji. And now all that stuff translates to engagement. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So how long did it take you before you had this sort of idea? How long did it take you to build to that 100,000 views? Um, so that happened pretty, uh, maybe, maybe less than a year or something mm -hmm. like that, if I remember correctly, because I, I shot it in, I can't remember when I shot it, but I shot it in maybe September of that year. And then I, I think I was monetized by maybe February or March. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was monetized mm -hmm. before mommy got dropped because once mommy dropped in, it dropped in spring or something like that. It took a while, oh no, mommy dropped in the October of the following year. So huh. is is yeah. So I was monetized, I think, in the spring, and then mommy dropped in 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 the fall because I made it for Halloween, and then put it on the channel, and then it it kind of went to around forty thousand views, and then something happened. I don't know what happened, but it went from forty thousand to like a hundred thousand, and then just kept like, it just it just started wow. flying. Yeah, and wow. people were commenting, and people were angry because like I have a mommy eating her children, and they're like. A mommy shouldn't do that. I'm like, bruh, I know a mommy shouldn't eat her children. Like, <laughs> like a mommy shouldn't do that. Like, okay, tell me something I don't know. <laughs> We're not spiders here. You know what I mean? Of course. We <laughs> not a documentary. I know it's not a documentary. And then and then the other thing that got a lot of attention was um was was the kid on the ground. So like when he's getting eaten by his mom, the fact that he can reach out like a lot of people were analyzing whether that was possible and how can he still talk and how can he still like you know and all that stuff is good so if you have any like interesting controversial things in there that's going to help on youtube because people want to get into it talk about it debate it you know and that all works you know it's it's all fun that's great and um <laughs> So what happened? Did YouTube approach you or were you like, okay, I'm at a hundred thousand views now? Oh, got you. Yeah. So, oh, oh that just kind of happens automatically. Uh -huh. So, well, I did have to make sure that I was a part of Google AdSense. Like you have to have like all these little verifications. Yeah. Like you need to already do that. Like right when you create the account, go ahead and like fill all that out. Right. Yes. So you fill all that out. So your verifications are in your ID that they know you are who you are, blah, blah, blah attach your bank account if you if you want to or I, I forget exactly what stage that was but you you link that and get that verified so that's all in place and then once those numbers kick in then the the system triggers them that says oh this this channel now qualifies mm -hmm. then it takes another few weeks for somebody internal they go and review it because I think they watch the videos that you have and make sure it's not you know porn or something like that yeah. <laughs> 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 and then and then they give you the the final tick so that took maybe another so once the thing said oh you're eligible for monetization and oh it'll be reviewed i didn't have to press anything i didn't have to do anything, do anything. okay yeah. and then a couple of weeks after that maybe another four weeks or something and then they were like oh you're eligible so now you can you know and then you can get all you get all these extra buttons and you can you can have some videos that are not monetized you don't have to monetize everything huh. but yeah, you can choose, like you can say, because you might have like, like, for example, let's say you have a social justice video message that you want to put out there, like stop Asian hate or something like that. If I wanted to do that, you could actually say, let's not monetize this because one, I don't want people seeing ads before right. this. Right. I don't want the message to be interrupted in the middle with maybe like a YouTube like uh, ad for mm -hmm. cigarettes or something like, you know, you don't want that. So so you can demonetize so that you get it. And, and that way also people don't feel like you're trying to profit off, off of everything and, and, yeah. and a social justice message particularly. Yeah. 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 So the, those are the kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. 
And do you have any control over the ads that show up? Yes, yes, absolutely. So you can like, you know, there's pre-roll, there's mid-roll. You know, a, a lot of the YouTubers now want to make sure their videos are at least eight minutes because at, ten, or it used to be 10, they lowered it to eight, but at, 10, at, at eight minutes, they can do a mid-roll ad. So at around four minutes or somewhere, they'll just stop it, do an ad and then continue. But they don't do that for ads for, for videos shorter than eight minutes. Mm. So you can choose if you want that though or not. Do you consider yourself a YouTuber? I do not. I do not. <laughs> um, and the problem is this. So because, so mommy made money, right? It made, uh, the, the film itself only cost me a few hundred dollars to make, right? So it was like a $300 film, uh, barring my equipment aside, right? Because I already have all the, you know, barring my tens of thousands of dollars yes. of equipment, the actual money that was spent to make that movie was about $300. I rented an oh, Airbnb. Wow. I was going to say, that sounds like pizza for the... Yeah, it's pizza <laughs> for the moms that, that had to sit there with, with, their, with Ava and with Mason uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, to buy the pack of condoms off my PA that, that Deanna, my art director, used to make the intestines. Those are Trojans. <laughs> my poor PA wasn't able to get some that day because we took his condoms, we bought his condoms right. off him. <laughs> And uh, and then uh, and then the Airbnb itself. So that was literally the cost of that one. And that one's I probably you know it's, it hasn't made that much on on YouTube because it's very it's not very monetizable, right? I mean it's uh, it's rated R. Uh, it's a mom uh, eating her children. Uh, Most I, advertisers aren't going to really want to be part of that, but it's probably made around sixteen hundred dollars on on YouTube. You know, so great. That's great. And how yeah. often do they pay you? They are very good. Like every six weeks, uh -huh. they 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 are uh, every six weeks at a minimum of a hundred though. So like you have to have basically my bank account is just attached, and whenever the the, the so every six weeks they do like uh, or actually every month is when they do the the totals, but the payouts are like every six weeks. And if if that total is more than a hundred, then it just goes into the payout. If it's not, it just rolls over to the next, let's say you got $90, it'll roll over to the next six week period. And if it's then over a hundred, money gets distributed. So it's a very smooth system, but the problem with YouTube for making money, um, for narrative filmmakers, I mean, that movie took me at least three, wait, three weeks to make, and that was pretty fast for a short film. Mm -hmm. um, and I did it all myself, you know, I didn't have any extra expenses for post and things like that. But as you know, Joanne, most films are collaborative. There are more people involved. It takes more time. There's so many logistics to figure out, like you send it to this, the colorist, yeah, and then the sound, and then the music, and then blah, blah, blah. And that doesn't really fit the YouTube model that well, because mm -hmm. if you really wanna make money on YouTube, you would need to be posting something like almost every day, or at the very mm -hmm. least every week. Mm -hmm. And I don't know many short filmmakers or narrative filmmakers who can turn over quality films every week. Like that's like uh, a little bit uh, intense. And um, there are people who've done it. Corridor is, is one of the channels on YouTube that makes a good amount of money making short films, um, but they are in the action comedy space. Yes. And so it's more of a, you know, universally, you know. Kind of it, kind of, I think uh, a friend of mine is it with, uh, I think it's called Smush. Is it called yeah. Smush? Okay, you, Smush. You know? yeah. But anyway, it's it's mm -hmm. basically a kind of, um, it's very sketch comedy kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. there's really very little in the way of production values. Yeah. Um, a lot of writing is involved. Yeah. Uh, a lot of writing and then, and then it has this sort of feel of, um, as that kind of SNL, yeah, where, where you don't have to try and make it look good or anything like that. Yeah, thrown together and fast. I was I was watching um, uh, the SNL. Did you see Beyonce in the Hot Wings? Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, but you know, I mean, it's great, but the production values are not exactly very high, and nobody gets. Yeah, you know? yeah, you're not going to be doing Christopher Nolan level. No. <laughs> level quality once a week you know yeah that being yeah. said Cor corridor 
um, is a channel on YouTube that does make money with shorts. Mm. Um, and they have an extremely high production value. But that's because what they've done is they have a like a five or six person team. And over time, they've been on YouTube for like maybe 10 or 15 years or something like that, you know. But they've developed a rhythm where their VFX level is is extremely high. And they're strictly in the comedy, you know, they, they have VFX, they have comedy, but they're really fast, right? They just, uh-huh. they can yeah. like turn it over and hand it over and they have a big enough following that everything they drop gets, you know, five, six million views or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so it, it justifies it because they're able to keep keep on producing. But they're literally, hello, maybe two, you know, like five or six channels that, that can operate at that level, you know? Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Because to be able to monetize sufficiently that you can have a five or six person team um, working uh, and and I have to figure out the name of this chat. It's called Smush, I think. But okay. there's yeah. a whole team writing every day, producing every yeah. day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you kind of have to double down and invest in that because there has to be a period of time like Rocket Jump is an example of one of those. And that guy, together with two of his friends, uh, Freddie Wong, he basically, they were in LA, they were filmmakers, and they were like, man, this YouTube thing is going to be a big deal. Let's commit for a year to make a short every single week for a year. Mm. And they didn't make any money in that first year. You get Mm. what I mean? So they kind of had to like bootstrap their lives for that year to sort of Mm. get through that period. Yes. And then they got a big following, and now obviously they're you know they're they've gone and taken flight, but it does take that investment of time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You uh, need like a sugar mommy or something, you know, yeah. or a sugar daddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's something we or, don't talk about much. Or, or, or about. raise money, or raise people, money. Pe- people don't talk about that. That's one thing I noticed. Like we're talking on Clubhouse, and everybody, you know, there's a tendency to be a bit politically correct at times. And, you know, people are asking, well, how do I raise the money to do this short film that I want to make, you know? And, <laughs> you, know, you know, you know as well as I do that the reality is it's usually uh, a dentist family member or it's your, you know, it's like there's usually that first few projects is going to be somebody that you know who just kind of sponsors it, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, yeah, you know, there's, there's raising money but it, it's gonna be hard to raise money if you've never made any films, right? You have nothing to show. So yeah, that's something we don't well, just, talk about. Just so you know, all my clients crowdfund. If they're making their first short with me, they all crowdfund 10, 12. Yeah, crowdfunding is good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's that's a, that's a, a legitimate way and everything. But, but the reality is there are probably many more people who just get the money from like a family member doing extra shifts picking up Uber, driving Uber for a yeah, few months. Yeah. You know, we're not talking about those kinds of like, just practical things, you know? Strapping, bootstrapping, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, or having a sugar mommy or a sugar daddy. I mean, that's a real thing, you know? I mean, it, it's, it's you know, if you're, if, if you have, let's say you're in a relationship, right? And the one partner has a really solid income and right. the other person is like, uh, you know, more of a creative and the income is like this, a lot of times that first money is coming from that partner, you know, and, and so those, those things we, when we're giving advice, we should probably sort of hint at that a little bit more just to give people a, a bit let's, of that idea. Let's have a, a sugar mommy, sugar daddy clubhouse. <laughs> we should, yeah, exactly. Who, yeah, we, you know what, that would be, that would be well, film, <laughs> filmmakers, sugar mommies and sugar daddies. <laughs> We're here to put the, the, the filmmakers who are looking for money together with the sugar mommies and sugar daddies <laughs> who have money and make it can make it rain. <laughs> that would probably be a hit. <laughs> probably would. It would get it would get noticed. Nadia says, please do that. So um, I don't know if uh, Joe, Mark, or Nadia can can come on a video. Mark's ready for the sugar mommy program. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> do any of you have a question? Not Get in the gym, Mark. Get in the gym, man. Face sure. for so long. Keep it tight. <laughs> oh my God, this is so funny to hear you guys. I was doing stuff at home, but um, it's so good to hear your story. Thank you for the inspiration and the ideas. <laughs> I think hey. we should start a room, sugar mommy, and sugar daddy for filmmakers. Oh yeah. Um, what was- <laughs> What was the most challenging thing you had during these productions um, and how you 
how you got over it or, or what was the most challenging episode during your productions, you can tell. Yeah, yeah, I can tell. That's a really good question. And, um, and I, I give it with a grain of salt because I know it will be different for everybody um, because different personalities. So I have a pretty big personality and that has helped me a lot because um, I'm not really afraid to ask for favors. So, so, you know, a lot of times I'm asking a lot of people for favors. And I think the biggest challenge for me has been knowing when to control the amount of people that I have on set versus um, making it bigger than it maybe needs to be. Because like sometimes, like, um, like I've had sets that maybe got too big and not everybody was aligned on the vision, you know? And so I've been on set and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, why, why is this person doing these things or, you know, you know, thinking that it should be like looking like this or the clothing should be like this or whatever. But it's because maybe they were not as aligned because it maybe got too big too fast. And um, so that's been an issue, um, but I don't think everybody would have that same issue. But I think that is that will, that one has been for me, just, just kind of like what I was explaining to Joanne that in the beginning, that I have a tendency to start really, really big with everything that I do. And then I kind of pull it back uh, when I kind of realize my boundaries. Um, and so that for me, I'm much better at that now. Like I, I am much more effective at knowing like, okay, let's just make this film with like a crew of six, you know, uh, <laughs> Let's, 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 I would rather have a more efficient crew than have like a whole lot of people who don't know, don't understand the movie, haven't read the script, uh, those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Thank Love you. to see you, Nadia. Yeah. What are you doing? Waiting for my film. What, Nadia, what, are you a filmmaker as well? Yeah. Yes, I am. You know, what kinds of films do you make? Um, I directed two. Um, one, it was more about about uh, the immigration. Okay, Those are yeah. the ones that I directed, but I have been um, part of the crew for, for different films. We have done different stuff. I can share it with you lately. Yeah, that's exciting. Yes. Yeah, keep me posted. I'm very interested. I already what... had you on, on um, Clubhouse. Thank you. Guys. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah. That's yes. excellent. You can DM me Elso anytime. I always say that because I Are answer all my DMs. Are you on Facebook or uh, Darian Danjong is on Instagram? Yeah, yeah, on okay. Darian Danjong on uh, Instagram, yeah. Okay, uh, I like you there. Thank Nadia, you, John, for this. Nadia okay. is also going to be making a short film that's about dating and Oh fun. yeah, oh. that's I a could... comedy. Maybe we should partner right here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's um, so fun. Keep me posted so, on that, please. I will. Mark, okay. Yeah. Mark Thank has you. a question. Yeah. So lovely to see you, Nadia. Mark has a question. Mark. Hey, there he is. just wants Thank to you. sign up for the Sugar Mummy program. Are you working on your Sugar yeah. Mummy strategy, Mark? <laughs> yeah. You got the cool glasses. Uh, That's a good start. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Well, uh, <laughs> keep that going. Well, uh, <laughs> congratulations on all the great stuff that you're doing, and and I really appreciate your your sharing. I'm working on my second feature length documentary film. The first one uh, got into 93 markets over PBS, but we're all nice. all trying to figure out how, how do I make money with it? And it seems like the most viable thing going right now are the virtual screenings with uh, show and tell. Uh, have you explored yes. any of that? Um, yeah, that's such a good question. So that, so I have a short, which I've just recently, uh, it's in post for um, editing and doing motion graphics. That's like a lot of times when I'm on Clubhouse, I've got that short in front of me and I'm working on motion graphics at the same time for that short. Um, and so for that short, so I have a kind of a long-term plan and the, the plan is really nothing to do with the studio system at all. Um, and that's not to say that I wouldn't accept any viable offers that would present themselves, mm -hmm. but it is to say that I'm not really putting my energy into trying to get some kind of a deal. Um, what I'm putting my energy into is I want to build a database of people who like the kind of sorts that I make um, because I have a consistent enough brand as far as what I'm interested in making, which is like science fiction, near future, pretty much anybody who is in love with Black Mirror generally will will like the stuff that I make. 
-hmm. So my idea, and, and like I said, this is not proven. This is just me manifesting and, and then I'm going to do it and then see how far that I get, which is hopefully very far. But um, the, the idea of it is to, with this first short film that's almost finished, to use that, it, uh, it's going to be free to watch. But what I want to do is, is find a way to get the emails of the people who are interested in watching that because I know the feature that I'm developing, which I'd like to shoot later this year, will be like lockstep in the same genre. So if they you like can this do, short, yeah. yeah. So, say it again. You, you, can, you can do that with the show and tell platform. If, you know, if yeah. you're streaming film, you can, you can have it up for a, a week or a month and then it, it captures the, the contact information for you. Th that's perfect yeah like and make sure if you have some really good ones i know i was in a room with this guy from 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 watchbeam.com and i know there was Streamyard. um you know so there are a few of them and and so yeah if you have the names of some good ones please please dm me and let me know because my, i do want to do that like i can get the actors on there i can be on there people could watch it we could have a q a you know and then collect all those emails so everybody who enjoyed it collect all those emails and do multiples of those on different platforms like you know just keep doing different of those is my idea um you know rack up the views so, rack up attention and and then when i go to the feature i have like a solid database of people who i know are waiting for that feature um yeah so i i just put on the chat uh, show and tell and zoom and then i've got my my email address market momc.tv and we could i'm happy to have a conversation with you and share because i'm taking two courses on how to do this and it oh, just great. Seems be the, it seems to be the only you know like i've been very successful screening at at uh, art museums and universities and yeah. getting paid and it's been a total joyful thing you know where you you do the q and a's with the audiences that are excited about your project and you make money doing it. So that's been the only, that's been the most successful thing for me. And now they have these streaming platforms and uh, the, the show and tell has a course program that you can subscribe to. And every week they teach you step-by-step -step how to do it. I've got my first, that's amazing. Uh, I'm, my first uh, streaming event that I'm negotiating with an arts organization called Artists for Peace. And we're doing a mutually beneficial uh, uh, fundraiser, but this seems to be it, it's a full time job, but yeah. it's it's a it's a way to take your film, be independent, and make money with it. And I'm yeah I'm hoping that it that it works in the long run. Yeah, and, 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 and honestly, Mark, was like, created by a filmmaker is the other thing. The yeah. platform oh. Show and Tell was created by a filmmaker. Oh, to try to address some of the things that, be, for example, I use Zoom all the time, but it's not really yeah. appropriate for showing films. The right. audio is not right. The, anyway, but so Show and Tell was designed by a filmmaker. I will check that one out. Yeah, yeah. And it allows you to like, a, yeah, okay, that's good. And then you could schedule things, and they all show up to the event, and it's a pay event and yes and yeah that that's exactly what i'm talking it, it, about you you schedule when uh, people can see it on demand or you can say it's at seven o'clock and then at 8 30 we're going to have our q a uh, or you can actually do a q a uh session with it with with let's say you want to get your cast and your crew and you can record that and then you can show that live as the presentation after your video and then mm -hmm. come on by yourself on a Saturday or a Sunday or a Friday night and yeah. just uh, be live and do Q and A with your audience. Yeah. And that's really so there's good. some great options. Yeah. I like that a lot. And I feel like that's the way to go because, you know, even though that sounds intimidating, like what you said, Oh, it sounds like a full-time job, but yeah, that sounds like a good full time job to me. You know, like if, if the, the full time job is me promoting my films and it becomes a full time job. Yeah, like that's great. Uh -huh. If that's I could make, great. let's say, even just one feature film a year and spend the whole year making the film and promoting the film and then kind of move to the next project. That's a good life. I could do that for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. Uh 
and uh, the um, the guy that uh, Keith Aquat, who is the founder of Show and Tell, he had a uh, he had a, a feature documentary film. He did a PBS run, and over a two year period, they did three thousand events. Some of them streaming, some of them live. And he yeah. made a, he brought in a million and a half dollars on a film that that once you once you send it to PBS, you're making zip. No, right. no, he had a hundred and twenty five thousand dollars sponsorship with uh, for for the PBS showing. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was he was it was underwriting on the film. That's he right. Got, so with, he got I mean, that's, to underwrite it. That's the so difference. That's, you know that business model perfectly well, Mark, which is you showed yeah. on PBS. PBS is not going to pay you, but you get two spots that you can underwrite so you can get a sponsor on that. So that's that's so you, that. you basically sell your own advertising space. That's right. Yeah. Okay. You sell your own advertising space. Exactly. Right. Which yeah. is a little bit like what you're doing on YouTube, right? I mean right. It's, it's the same concept, which is your film is on there, and then you're selling the rights uh, for advertising, and that's where the money is coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah um, very cool. Well, Katie, I'm, we were just about to finish. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Full time job <laughs> took me away. Exactly. To Jobs just get in the way. I know they do. <laughs> hey, Katie, how's it going? <laughs> Hey, good. It's so great to meet you. I saw the topic and I wanted to jump in and I... Yeah. It's okay. I did remember to record this time because my last <laughs> guest, we forgot to hit record. So because the, the fabulous Angela was not with us. So, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so we have recorded this um, and you're definitely going to want to watch it, Katie. Uh, Darren, you know, one thing I don't know is where are you based? Atlanta, Georgia. Ah, okay then. Yeah. Great, great, yeah. great. A great film city, by the way. It's it is definitely very exciting here. Yeah. What what about everybody else? Uh Nadia and Katie are in the Bay Area. Mark is in New Mexico and Joe I can't remember. I'm in the Washington oh. DC area. Washington DC, that's right. DC. That's right. Yes, DC. Okay. What, what about what, what Mark, where are you? Uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. New Mexico. Oh, New Mexico's got those good uh, tax credits. Yes. No yeah. bottom. Yeah. No Which bottom on we, the tax credits. We were able to borrow money from a bank based on our anticipated rebate for mm, production. That's crazy. That that's... A, yeah, you, you know, we were we were like five years into the project, so they could see that there was a, that we were going to bring get a rebate. And so we put that into production. You can do that here. They're, the banks, they have a law that allows them to do that. That's incredible. Come on out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Shoot yeah, there's Western. people have been talking to me about like the shooting in New Mexico for that reason, yeah. Is, is that not the case? Because because George is so famous for their great um, tax rebates. But, but we have a bottom to it. And I think it's about okay. 500,000. If oh. I'm, I'm just off the top of my head. So it doesn't really help Indy. Like, like truly, truly, yeah, yeah, truly yeah. indie. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. we've all know oh, three million dollars is supposedly indie, but that's not my level of indie, it, not yet, not in New yet. Mexico, in New Mexico, if you uh, spend four thousand dollars on your film, you're going to get a thousand back. Yeah, wow. that's wow. incredible. If you spend a million, if you spend a million dollars, you get a quarter of a million back. A quarter of a million back. Yeah. Wow. That's huge. Right. I think in the Bay Area, the the floor is a hundred thousand. Okay. So Joe, we'll have to find out in DC what the floor is for the tax credits and rebates. Well, I mean, we've got three different jurisdictions right here, so I'm right on really? the of Maryland. So it's we have Maryland, Virginia, and the district, and they're all different. Mm, maybe it's, you can take them all. The joy here. Take them all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would be nice but, yeah. but 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 that new mexico model is phenomenal that you yeah. know if you and they, they model, give you 35 percent if you do an episodic because yeah. that means you're going to stay for a while if you if you do a series here you get 35 percent back if it's a one-up it's 25 percent 
It's really amazing to hear that this. That explains why Netflix is moving to New Mexico. Isn't that where yeah. they're moving? Yeah, yeah. they're here. They're, they're here, here, yeah. Yeah. The thing and is, Marvel. The, the thing is, we always hear about Atlanta, 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 Georgia, Georgia, Georgia. But apparently, it's time for mm -hmm. us to move to New Mexico. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I'm from Atlanta, but when I hear those kinds of numbers, yeah. that's, that's huge because, I mean, like, you know, I'm planning to spend less than $10,000 for my micro budget feature later this year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So imagine, I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to, I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to go to New Mexico for that necessarily, but the idea that I could get $2,500 back yes. on the 10000 you know, I mean, obviously I'd have to do the math and see if it works out with flights and with staying because that's an extra cost that, that comes into it. But it's a big deal. <laughs> the big deal. Very big deal. It's fantastic. Well, well, if you decide to do it, let me know. I'll coach you through it. <laughs> I'll be your late, your New Mexico liaison. Yeah, let's do it, man. <laughs> well, Darian, thank you so much. And thank you for our YouTube lessons and our Clubhouse <laughs> lessons from you. Mm -hmm. And good luck with your film this year. And, thank you um, very much. I'll be keeping everyone posted on that because that's definitely a, a, a process that I want to make super transparent the entire way. Uh, and the only thing that I'm doing is I'm going to check. I want to just check with some entertainment attorneys on just copyright and when is it safe to start sharing? Because I would love to share the whole process, literally from writing it, like everything. But I just want to make sure with whatever there, what is smart about IP, if I'm sharing it while I'm writing, am I am I potentially getting myself into, uh, you know, losing my losing control of my, you know what I mean? Like like I just want to check that out first. But if that's all safe, then I I, I will start to share the whole process, literally everything. So sure. that's what I'm hoping to be able to do. I mean, I can I can tell you a little bit about that. Basically, oh, any, any, you. anything you create is copyrighted just just from jump. Yeah. But if you register the copyright, there's you uh, get better damages in court if you have to sue someone. Sure, so sure. That's a significant difference. Yeah, I, I always come from the position of, and definitely check with a lawyer. I am not a lawyer, but I come from the position of. If I were to steal your script from you today, I'm still not going to make the film that you're going to make. Right, right. And I, just, I just don't see the point in worrying about it very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's true. Yeah, and that's what I'm. That's what I'm leaning towards. And, and so you know, so this would be a really fun adventure. Uh, just the idea of like, can you build? Can you build enough of an audience to? you know, make make a micro budget film like that viable. And this will hopefully be the first of many. And then I could just keep doing that. That's and right. that, that'll be that'll doing. be my life. Yeah. Yeah. So. Exactly. Exactly. Darian, this has been a total pleasure. And thank you so much for joining us today. I was and only shooting for a half play pleasure. So it makes uh -huh. me really happy that we went we got to total. <laughs> 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 That's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been a pleasure learning about your work so we'll be in touch absolutely thank you so much for having me Joanna and thanks to everybody for putting up with me for an hour here not at all you <laughs> bye bye cheers bye everyone